Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this very special Lunch and Learn event. This is a unique version, as you will discover today. My name is Lori Hevela, and I'm a proud graduate of the class of 65 in electrical engineering, and I currently serve as the chair of the school Lunch and Learn program. I would like to thank all of you for being here with us today from around the world to this, our very special edition of School Lunch and Learn. After reviewing the registration list, we have alumni tuning in from all over the world, as has been happening, including Canada, of course, Hong Kong, Mexico, Singapore, and the United States of America. Welcome to all of you. For those of you that are new to Lunch and Learn, did you know that Lunch and Learn was founded by the class of 3T5? During that time, it was tough finding jobs. So the group decided to meet monthly and they did so at Friends Restaurant on College Street here in Toronto. And well, the rest is history. Before starting today's presentation, we would like to acknowledge that this land on which the University of Toronto operates for thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to live and work on this land. A quick housekeeping item. At the end of today's presentation, we will have time for a formal question and answer session. Should you have any questions for Professors David Sintom, Elham Marzi, or Timothy Chan, please submit them using the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. In addition, for the individuals who submitted questions during the registration period, we have shared your questions with each of the speakers before today's presentation, and we'll continue to share any new questions asked during the course of today's session at the end of the presentation. Now, without further ado, it brings me great pleasure to introduce our special guest host, Dean Chris Yip. Professor Christopher Yip began his term as the 14th Dean of the Faculty of Applied Science and Engineering on July 2nd, 2019. After serving for two years as Associate Vice President in the university's International Partnerships Office, as well as the Director of the Institute for Biomaterials and Biomedical Engineering. Dean Yip is a grad of 85 Chemical Engineering who also serves as a faculty member with the Department of Chemical Engineering and Applied Chemistry, the Department of Biochemistry, and the Institute of Biomedical Engineering. And now, with great pleasure, please join me in welcoming Dean Chris Yip. Great. Thank you, Lori, for that warm introduction. Uh, just one minor connection, because you're going to date me. It's actually class of 88. So I'm just going to, I'm going to be three years younger um, than, than you introduced me as. Um, and I will also say that one of the very first things I did when I started as a faculty member here um, a few years ago, back in 97, was actually do a lunch and learn. Um, and it was a terrific opportunity to talk about my research and the same format that we're using today, although it was in person at the time. Um, so welcome everybody to, uh, to this lunch and learn. I'm really excited about it. Um, one of the best parts of my job um, is really the ability to just walk through our campus. And we are back in person, as many know, uh, and it's been just a terrific opportunity to reconnect with faculty, reconnect with our students, and really get a chance to see what everyone is doing, just the outstanding work they're doing, uh, the ability to see really the future being designed here on campus. And today, this event is really designed to give you the opportunity to, to also get a sense of what we're doing and, and get that same kind of experience. Uh, certainly, we would love it uh, when we get back to doing things in person person as well, but we also want to continue to engage our, our alum from afar, and it's terrific that we have folks join, join us from so many different places around the globe. Um, in a few moments, we're going to hear from three absolutely amazing researchers about how they're developing uh, bold solutions for a better world. Um, these projects are going to be different from each other, but 
they really reflect the key elements of U of T's recently launched campaign called the uh, defy gravity. Uh, the scale of our ambition is indeed unprecedented. It's the largest university campaign in Canadian history. Uh, we're going to harness the power of our global community. Uh, more than half a million alum, nearly 100,000 students, and more than 23,000 faculty and staff with the aim of realizing projects uh, for the betterment of humanity. As many of you know, U of T has an absolutely amazing uh, history of discovery from insulin to stem cells to neural networks to deep learning. Uh, with Defy Gravity, we're going to build on this tradition to grapple with really the biggest challenges of our time, which include climate change, inequality, and, and the effect of, of technology on us, and that sort of mass disruption. Uh, so today you're going to hear about some absolutely astounding institution-wide projects, such as the Climate Positive and Energy Initiative, which brings together industry, community, and government to develop tools to prevent the most uh, catastrophic impacts of a changing climate. You're also going to hear how we're trying to engineer and working to develop a better healthcare system by drawing on insights from the, that amazing intersection of operations research and robotics. And also, really important, how we're really preparing our next generation of engineering leaders to succeed in a world that is globally connected, as we see, changing really rapidly. So how we develop our students uh, to be able to adapt and be flexible and, and recognize the ability uh, their ability to contribute to, uh, towards positive change. Um, as, as we all see now for now two years, this COVID pandemic has shown th these challenges don't, they're not kind of planned in advance and uh, we can't predict when they're gonna happen, but we need to be prepared and we wanna make sure that our graduates are ready to meet them, uh, meet these challenges head on. Uh, I've said this many times, I am so proud of our students, their ability to complement their technical skills uh, with their abilities to communicate leadership, entrepreneurship, uh, whether it's summer research placements, uh, professional experience here, co-ops, uh, so many opportunities to engage. Now, through these, these opportunities, meet new people, encounter new ideas, and, and gain a global perspective. And that's really how we're, we're meeting the challenges of the 21st century. Uh, we really are part of a global community, and thousands of our alumni are choosing to give back to their alma mater, and whether it's as a volunteer for mentors, uh, scholarships, uh, catalyzing research collaborations, uh, it's all about integrating our opportunities, whether it's across research, education, or entrepreneurship, uh, reaching beyond our traditional disciplines. And a lot of what I've been doing the past couple of years is actually trying to, is, has been bridging into other disciplines and, and bringing those opportunities to our students and also bringing opportunities for other students to engage with engineering. So we're really excited about that. And that's how we're going to have impact, not just in Toronto, uh, but here in Canada and, and around the world. Okay, so enough about that. Let's get to our first speaker. So I'm really pleased to introduce our first speaker, uh, Professor David Sinton uh, from our Department of Mechanical Industrial Engineer, uh, Engineering. Um, Dave is an alumnus of UT Engineering, uh, completed his undergraduate as well as his PhD and his, his expertise is in fluid systems, uh, which covers a wide range of different fields uh, from microfluidics for reproductive technologies. And Dave, we're gonna put a shout out to the collaborative paper we did between our two labs and that particular project. It was an amazing project, worked really well. <laughs> I had to put that in there, uh, to the production of renewable fuels from captured CO2, and maybe we can get a project going in that space as well, you never know. Um, Dave is the Canada Research Chair in Microfluidics and Energy, and has served uh, amazing in several key administrative roles in our faculty, including the Interim Vice Dean of Research. Um, and he was recently named the head of our Climate Positive Energy Initiative, uh, which I described earlier. So today he's going to tell us about uh, that and his group's uh, groundbreaking research in, uh, into upcycling uh, CO2, which can both reduce the demand for new fossil fuel extraction uh, and offer an innovative way to store energy from renewable sources. So Dave, over to you. Thanks, Chris, and, and thanks all. It's a pleasure uh, to be here. And, um, and I'll have to start my timer here and try to be more disciplined than usual because we've got three great speakers lined up. Um, so as Chris mentioned, you know, my passion is really in, in, in CO2 and, and that's at the center of climate and energy. It's really where those two topics meet. And um, there's, uh, there's <clears throat> lots, of, uh, lots of interest in those areas for, for, uh, for many reasons. So I wanna talk about, there we go. The net zero carbon goals, you know, five years ago, if you were a company or a country and a government, and you had a net zero carbon goal, you really stood out. You were different, um, progressive. Um, now you stand out if you don't have one. Really, it's become the norm, this idea that we, we're, we're shifting towards a, a net zero or net negative or, 
or as we put it, U of T, we'll talk about in a few minutes, climate positive uh, world. And that 2050, that is uh, right around the corner. That is really in the context of the change in the energy system, that is almost immediate. So it's a really great challenge and, and it signifies a, um, a, a shift in values. I was gonna say a norm shift, but it's really a shift in values when much of, of the world commits to net zero carbon. So that's exciting, but we're, we're past the pledge stage now. We're really committed on this as a university, as a country, as a world. Um, but what happens now? How do we achieve this? And, and, and the bad news is, and that won't be surprising to engineers in the audience, that, that the ride's gonna be a little rough. It's gonna be challenging. Um, Shoshana Sachs, who's a, who's a great thinker here at U of T, uh, in this space, you know, put it well the other day that, that the problem is harder than we want it to be. Part of the challenges uh, I've, I've highlighted here, energy storage. Renewables are the one gift really of the last 10, 20 years. Um, it, the, the, the expansion of renewables is really exciting. Reduction in cost, fantastic. That is our lever. That's what we've got um, to, to, um, to address this challenge. But storing that energy, that's a fundamental challenge. Persistent CO2 emissions, you know, Bill Gates wrote a great paper in 2021, a white paper, really making the case that we just cannot ignore these persistent emissions because they will be persistent. Heavy industry, um, um, sustainable aviation fuels, as an example, these are the toughest third of emissions. And then energy security, uh, this has always been. Uh, important, but we've been able to forget about it for the last couple of decades, right? We really haven't, we thought about green energy, that's really important. Energy security, we haven't worried much about, but that's all changed in the last two weeks. Uh, for those of us old enough to remember some of the 70s and 80s, we're seeing energy supply crunch, we're seeing rising energy prices, we're seeing rampant inflation, we're seeing great power dynamics and conflict. Uh, this, is, this is that 70s show, um, except it's not a comedy. And, and lots of uh, familiar challenges are coming back. And energy security is one of those um, that, that we will face and, and will, be, will be top of mind for the next few decades. And I wanna to touch on how this climate positive energy thing is pulling it all together. My own research looks at CO2 in, in, um, in our energy system and how we can reuse it, not vent it as we have in the past, from industrial operations or from our own homes and vehicles, but capture that and then convert it into things that we use. So I'm gonna tell two stories here. Um, one is on the, on the conversion side. What can we make with CO2 given this gift of renewable electricity? Can we turn that renewable electricity into a storable form, a storable chemical form? And then I'm gonna have one little vignette on the, on the input side. Can we capture that CO2 efficiently from the air, from these persistent sources? draw down the atmospheric levels of CO2. So our journey over the last uh, seven years here um, has, been, has been one of scaling really. So, and I say our, this, this work uh, we do in partnership with the Sargent Research Group at University of Toronto. And it's been a real, it's been a real trip. It's been a, a journey as I put it there. Um, and we started small. We started with our collective expertise in small scale systems, nano catalysts, and, and then gradually, you know, up to electrodes. And then I really started to get excited when we, we, we moved into the, the, how do we build electrodes and, and, and electrode systems so that we can do all the good chemical and mechanical engineering bits, get the reactants to the catalyst, get the products away, concentrate those products so someone would actually want to buy it. And then how do we build real systems? So it was really 2019, we were, we were looking at, can we build real integrated systems. And then, and then a big push from 2019 to 2021, if this looks like a big jump for you, it was a big jump for us too. And for the field, it was really enabled by, by the Carbon X Prize. They, the, the prize dared us and the world to scale these technologies thousands of times when, when you know, maybe a good engineering approach would have been to try 100 first. Um, we learned a tremendous amount out of that. I'm going to touch on that briefly. And then, and then now what's next is this CO2 capture side, can we use electrochemical methods to help address that? So the ethanol story, this is a, this is a uh, ethanol uh, production plant in, in uh, Ontario. And the standard process here, right, these are, this is bioethanol, these are digesters. 
And this is the established approach that by which um, ethanol is produced for, um, for the clean fuel standard and, and other uses. And, and why I mention this is important, the two reasons. One is because this has a lot of, there's a lot of CO2 emissions associated with this process. Um, and then also the, if you wanna compete with this, if you wanna to add to this with, a, with an electrochemical approach, you better be able to make something that's competitive with the output of this process. And, and that's something I'm passionate about and what's something we steered our group towards. People had made ethanol from CO2 before electrocatalytically, but not at a concentration anyone would buy. I won't take you through the details here, but, but uh, late last year we achieved 13, uh, upwards of 14% ethanol production from CO2 directly using electricity, which I think is like a Merlot or <laughs> maybe something like that, um, lacking the flavor of course. But, but the key point is an output that's compatible with downstream processes. And we're excited about that from CO2 and electricity. This overall system I mentioned is, was, was uh, built up in this case for, for uh, ethylene production. And maybe you saw the news yesterday uh, that was highlighting Christine Gabardo. She's my postdoctoral fellow. And now she's full-time in this company uh, that she has co-founded uh, CERT Systems Inc. And this is the site out in Calgary where we really cut our chops with this plant. This plant's coming home to Toronto now. Um, that's me asking, where's the CO2 come in? <laughs> XPRIZE is, uh, that was an XPRIZE project, as I mentioned. XPRIZE is spring eternal, of course. Um, Elon Musk um, has, has funded this huge one. This is a $100 million project over the last, over the next um, many years. And the vision here is don't just convert CO2, but you gotta capture it. You gotta get it from the air uh, and then put it into a storable or a long-term form. And um, so our, our team got to work and, and thought, can we, can we address one of the persistent challenges with existing CO2 capture? And, and one of the challenges is like any major chemical process, it requires lots of energy input. And, and currently, you know, these contactors are well-developed, this blue box here uh, in Canada has some great expertise on this area. Um, but the challenge was this box, right? So what, how do we get that CO2 out of that capture solution the current solution is you heat it. And then to heat it, you need a lot of fossil fuel input and then you have associated emissions with that. You can come out at the end ahead in terms of CO2 capture, but, but you're really shooting yourself in the foot. So we asked, could we, could we use renewable electricity to provide the energy source and efficiently convert that capture fluid into CO2 and close the loop? Um, so, so a little bit of... Uh, 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 I guess a nibble of success from Elon Musk here, uh, the U of T won um, this, this uh, prize for uh, as a student award and are uh, surviving to fight another day here. And we'll see, hopefully they can get a bit more uh, funding as the prize moves along. But, but their approach I'm really excited about is really promising in terms of energy input per ton of CO2 captured. Great, I wanna wrap up and, and, and note the, uh, I, was, I was at a, um, uh, a great alumni event as a participant quietly while my, making dinner <laughs> and, uh, and organizing my kids. Maybe some of you were there for the, the discussion on campus, history of campus and then the climate positive uh, campus initiative and, and exciting changes that are coming to campus. Um, one of which was the geo exchange system, which is really exciting. And this is, this is facilities at U of T really looking at how we can do better as a university. On our side, we thought, well, we're, we're researchers. Can we use the university's research power, the intellectual power of our researchers across the tri-campus and apply that to the same theme? So we stole their name, Climate Positive, and we call it Climate Positive Energy. And this is, this is a collection of over 100 faculty from across three campuses. And, and two tidbits of engineering uh, physical relevance here. One is the Chemical Engineering S Lab. This is an exciting plan we've got. Um, led by chemical engineering to put a sustainable energy lab on the roof. Um, that's going to be an exciting pillar uh, of our energy research going forward. And then closer to my home, the energy transition lab. Some of you will remember the engines lab. Uh, to me, the real great hall at U of T. Um, renovating that to, to reflect the next hundred years, right? Um, electric vehicles, thermal challenges in those, and some of my CO2 capture work. Great. Thank you very much.
Great. Thanks so much, Dave, for uh, an outstanding talk. And thank you for highlighting all the, the contributions engineering is going to make. And uh, I'm actually happy that as the dean, I've supported the uh, your transition for the Heat Engines Lab, um, the S-Lab project. And uh, if you've been on campus recently, you have seen the emergence now of the geothermal project, uh, which is really taking over. And it's just an astounding opportunity for our students actually to be engaged in that project as well, to see it from both the civil engineering perspective, the mechanical engineering perspective um, and just the complexity of running a project that's that size in the middle of downtown Toronto. There's some absolutely astounding stats on how many dump trucks were coming out of campus uh, during the during the fall. So maybe we're glad there weren't that many students on campus with the trucks running back and forth. Anyways, thank you so much, Dave. We're going to get back to you with questions towards the end of this session. Um, our next speaker is Professor Elham Marzi, who is a member of our Institute for Studies in Transdisciplinary Engineering Education Practice, or ISTEP, our, our most recently created created uh, institute. Uh, she brings to the richness of our faculty um, insights from the world of business, including deep expertise in organizational behavior, uh, human resources management, strategy, and negotiations. Um, I think I should take a course from you, Elham. I think this is something that a dean needs to know as well. Uh, strongly involved in our business minor program, uh, one of the many specializations our students can participate in. And as you'll hear, she has a passion for active learning and innovative teaching strategies, which our students and our faculty certainly appreciate and benefit from in so many ways, especially uh, over the past couple of years. Um, her work really illustrates the, the ways which are enabling even more of our students to gain global experiences and develop cultural sensitivities that uh, will serve them well no matter where in the world they end up. Uh, Elham has been a, a real driver for what has now emerged as the Global Leaders Program at U of T, an initial, a brand new tri-campus, first ever tri-campus minor. Uh, engineering is taking the lead for all of St. George campus uh, in this Global Leaders Program. Uh, we're really proud to have that role and, and Elham really has been a, a real driver and a, a real strategy a lead for the uh, for the entire campus so thank you Elham I'm gonna put a plug in for that program so uh, thank you so much for your efforts there. Um, Elham the global floor is yours. Wonderful thank you so much Chris. Uh, hello everyone and thank you for joining us. I uh, Kudos to to all of all of you for taking time out of your schedules to be here, and thank you, Chris, for that incredibly warm introduction. Uh, so, as uh, the dean has mentioned, uh, part of the pro portfolio that I specialize in uh, looks towards building global opportunities for students, building opportunities for them to increase their professional skills in a way. Uh, as a teaching stream faculty member, my research focuses on the content that I teach in a, perhaps a different way with the education lens placed on it. So today I'm going to talk to you about an area of my research that focuses on building global opportunities for students and increasing access to developing these global competencies and skills. So one of the projects that's near and dear to my heart that anyone who's come within a, a two meter radius of me, especially during the pandemic, that's getting pretty close, um, has had to listen to me uh, rant and rave about invest. And while invest sounds like a financial strategy, it's also uh, meant to symbolize the international virtual engineering student teams portfolio that I am driving forward. Now, I will say that nothing is possible without contributions from an incredible team and without the support of a faculty in a university that sees the value in, in this type of a uh, in this type of an initiative. So I'm greatly thankful to a Dean Strategic Fund and I'm greatly thankful to the team that I worked with to build this initiative. So the mission of this part of what we were doing and this part of our research was to not only create a program that allows for inclusive, equitable, global experiences, but also opens the door to research how we can create these inclusive experiences, how we can help students prepare for the job market after they graduate. Realizing that the job market of today is not the job market that it was 20 years ago, or even five years ago, 
It's much more globally diverse. It's much more virtually rooted. And it expects people to have flexible skills, to be able to collaborate, and to be able to be uh, aware and sensitive towards others' needs. So a lot of our engineering courses here in the Faculty of Applied Science at the University of Toronto provide stu students with an excellent array of tools to get them out into the workforce. But being intentional about how we understand and how we learn and collaborate with each other is something that is of great importance. So at, with INVEST and with the INVEST initiative, this is one of the things that we prioritized. So we fed research into our, our plan and our program. And one of the, uh, well, there are three areas in which we align with the university's path forward in terms of the Defy Gravity project, both from creating global leaders programs and from creating the INVEST project and creating opportunities for students to develop these skills in general. We're developing opportunities to support student success. So uh, giving them access to global research projects, giving them access to collaborative and global classrooms, uh, helping them intentionally develop these skills has been fundamental in not only the research we do, but also the practice and the practical programs that we de develop. We've also had the opportunity to work with countless, well, actually, I won't say countless, because we've, we're still limited in uh, some of the faculty who participated with, with our INVEST program, but we're looking to engage more faculty, not only across Faculty of Applied Science and Engineering, but also across the entire university. So bringing faculty in, such as Professor Norval, um, Professor Vehdenon, and numerous other faculty from within uh, engineering, we've been able to establish partnerships with international institutions around the world uh, to build creative projects that our students either at an undergraduate level or a graduate level can participate in. So it's research twofold, as I mentioned earlier, and using that opportunity to learn from each other. We've also tried to work towards helping these projects that we are hosting, these research opportunities, uh, allow for students to focus on sustainable development goals. So we've managed to incorporate at least one sustainable development goal into each of the research projects that we host. So I'll tell you a little bit more about the purpose of the research. We're looking towards finding a way to incorporate active and experiential learning into curriculum as students are taking their courses, either at undergraduate or graduate levels. But we're also looking to do this with intentionality. So if a student is engaged in a capstone course or an MEng course, how can we incorporate aspects that don't add to a burden of you know, adding more work for the student, but also create the ability for the student to intentionally think about how to collaborate with their international counterparts, to intentionally work towards coming up with creative solutions that are culturally aware and culturally sensitive. So to do this, we've established these partnerships and some of our partnerships are focused in uh, various regions in Africa, Europe, South America, um, and even in North America as well. These opportunities help us and the students and our overarching research question at the end of this, we are also collecting data and information and examining our processes to be intuitive and insightful in how we're doing, um, how we're executing our program. So part of our research questions focus on uh, how are the students experiencing the program? Uh, where are the students in terms of their skill levels, experience levels prior to starting the program? And how do we help them uh, advance and develop as they progress through the program? So one of the best ways we can do this is by actually executing some of these, uh, these tasks. And so we've done uh, a lot of research into what the best form of uh, enabling and equipping students with these skills could be. The model that we've come up with and that we've been researching for the past two and a half years uh, focuses on acquiring projects that are initiated by uh, partner institutions uh, abroad. 
these partner institutions will submit uh, an idea or a project concept. Uh, we will establish a partnership here with faculty members with similar research interests and areas that can supervise and only act as supervisors for our students. They don't have to actually be engaged as faculty members in the research project. We determine whether those research projects are ideal for graduate level or undergraduate level students, and then we engage in the, the recruitment cycle for both, uh, both institutions. When the students come together, we administer what we have come to call and know and love uh, global competency modules. Based on the research that we've done, we've determined some of the key skills that help virtual international or intercultural teams succeed. As we go through these modules over a 10 to 12 week program, students develop skills as they develop their relationships within the teams. This can be highly effective because when the students are experiencing the projects and experiencing the needs for some of these, uh, these skills, they are able to develop them and gain them, apply them live in an experiential way. So far, what we found, some of our research has told us that before working in the programs, most of our students have worked in teams. And I know if you're an engineering graduate from the University of Toronto, that doesn't come as a surprise to you. Most of our students have also had the benefit of working in multicultural teams. However, when we focus on multicultural teams being located in one geographic area, it doesn't necessarily mean that full diversity is represented within these teams. Um, barriers that we identified at the outset of our research indicated that challenges that may be related to language or to connectivity or to time may interfere with group work projects uh, and virtual teams. So we started to think about how we can navigate around those. In terms of our learnings and our takeaways from the program, we determined that asking the students to engage with each other and, excuse me, <clears throat> and participate in the modules has really enhanced their intercultural learning and awareness. They are able to learn from each other. They are able to share their stories and develop relationships. And from doing that, they are able to improve the quality of their work, the engagement that they have with the core um, crux of the problems they're trying to solve within their research projects. We also recognize that the appreciation of diversity and diverse thought uh, is, is actually hyper present in these teams. When students have the opportunity to engage with a partner who is located somewhere else in the world, they take the project a lot more seriously. Not that I'm saying they don't take local projects seriously, but when they know exactly who this is going to impact. When the uh, sustain, global sustainable goal is not something that is at arm's length, but is immediately right in front of their eyes. One of the key skills that we were able to impart on the students through the project that helped improve their project success was also related to project management and coordination skills. When teams come together and work intentionally, it helps them move quickly past some of those storming stages where conflict can persist. So we found uh, that it helped teams develop trust, cohesion, and improve their intercultural communication strategies. Our overall findings guided us to learn what it takes to build a global engineer. Our global engineers are looking towards developing and achieving these intercultural competencies. They have learned to be, and through our modules, but also through our research, we found that they, students, have learned to, to listen to each other first, to respect diversity of thought and opinion, and to engage fully as their authentic selves within these teams. It's incredibly important for us to support student success by imparting the 21st century skills that students need as they venture out and work on these global teams. So our partners are dispersed throughout the world. Bringing these opportunities to our students has really helped them learn, but it's also helped us learn. I myself have had the 
privilege and pleasure of listening to students from a huge variety of fields. We've worked on solar ship design, we've worked on generating an understanding about cassava waste, we are currently talking about how to collect information from agricultural systems. All of this wouldn't have been possible without intentionally setting out to learn about different groups, different people from different places. And these are skills that help our graduates become the global engineers that they need to be to go out into society and to do what they do best. So leaving you with a few quotes from some of our participants, uh, both of these two fantastic students were parts of uh, two uh, relatively mid-sized mid to large groups and we're proud of their contributions as well. So I'll leave you with that and thank you so much for your time and this opportunity to be here with you today. Pass it over to Chris. Great. Thanks so much, Elham. That was an outstanding uh, presentation on a really innovative uh, initiative. Again, thank you. I am I am so proud that you've used our team strategic funds uh, in such a terrific manner and leveraging it. So many partners. I remember your initial proposal was sort of small and it's clearly it's, it's globally expanded and that's a, a terrific uh, evidence of the uh, the impact and success and, and wishing you more success in that way. And, and there's more money available for you to do that. I'll just put that out there for you. Um, it fits really well. One of the things I came into my role and I, I promised two years ago, almost three years ago, that every one of our undergraduates have an in international experience before they graduated. And I think this is this is one way it's heading that direction, uh, although virtually I, I still want to get our students out there and, and we're going to get them out there soon enough. Um, and I'll actually add so a noodling idea that we came up with yesterday in a bit of a discussion was the opportunity for our students to start to participate in summer language institutes working with um, with arts and science on how to promote that because I think that's another huge opportunity for our students that would actually address uh, some of those interests in that particular space who so are working actively in, in doing even more to support the, the initiative that you've got going. So again, thank you so much, Elham. I'm sure there's going to be some, some good you. questions for you coming up. Um, so to our, our last speaker, uh, Professor Tim Chan, again from uh, MIE, Mechanical Industrial Engineering. Uh, Tim is an expert in optimization under uncertainty. And this is a perfect time to be talking about uncertainty, Tim, um, and has applied optimization methods to an impressive range of different fields, uh, medicine, sustainability, and even management of professional sports. And I know, Tim, you did try to predict my best marathon time using uh, analytics to look at my past marathon times. I, I still need to take you up on that and see how well I can come to your predicted um, version of where I should be. Um, Tim holds the Canada Research Chair in Novel Optimization Analytics and Health. Uh, he also heads up our Center for Analytics and Artificial Intelligence Engineering, uh, which is also known as CART. I'm going to give a huge plug to CART because it was the uh, first pillar uh, that got launched in the, in the university's institutional initiative around data sciences. And it really was the, the I think I say the keystone or the foundation for what is now the Data Sciences Institute. So full props to Tim for uh, pushing forward on CART, getting it out there ahead of the game and then bringing the rest of the institution along uh, with it. And Tim serves in a leadership role inside the DSI right now. And it's a, a hugely impressive opportunity uh, for U of T going forward uh, in a really important area. Um, you will have seen Tim in the news in a good sense, uh, because his research has had tons of media coverage, uh, in particular on the topic he's gonna to talk to us about today, which is this intersection of robotics and emergency medicine. So I'm gonna hand it over to Tim. Go ahead, Tim. Thanks, Chris, uh, for that very generous introduction, probably too generous. Um, since this is recorded and since he's promising Elham money, I think we should all take the opportunity to ask for some money from the Dean right now before he changes his mind. Okay, um, okay well, thank you uh, again, Chris and, and uh, Lori and the rest of the organizing committee for inviting me to speak here today. It's my pleasure to be here. Um, thank you uh, to all of the alumni and others around the world who are, who are um, taking some time out of their day to participate. Um, so today I'm gonna talk about this uh, research uh, program that is, is shown here. Um, it's perhaps a bit pie in the sky uh, as, as one might say, but hopefully by the end of the presentation, I will convince you that this is not as far-fetched and not as uh, futuristic as it might seem uh, to begin with. Okay, so let me start with uh, a quote 
um, from Charles Darwin. It is not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent, but the one most responsive to change. And, and I think there's really two items uh, in this quote that really speak to the general theme of, of the research that I'm going to talk about. So around the responsiveness nature, you know, we're seeing uh, so many changes, you know, uh, so many changes these days around how quickly technology is evolving, how data driven society is becoming, um, how advanced analytics, machine learning, data science, and all of these uh, techniques are, are really changing the changing society. Um, we what we're interested in is is being responsive to these technological and data changes and 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 bringing them to to use to improve health outcomes. So that's the survival piece. Okay, uh, and and the research that I'm going to talk about today is all around basically optimization, basically on engineering to uh, improve health. Uh, before I talk about the specific topic around drones and defibrillators. I just want to take a minute to highlight a lot of the work that's happening in and around engineering, uh, really centered at the Center for Healthcare Engineering uh, that many of my colleagues and, and other students are doing. So at the center here, we've got about a dozen faculty and a few dozen graduate and undergraduate students working on a wide range of problems, which I would characterize as health systems uh, problems. So as you can imagine, we've been quite busy over the last couple of years. I have colleagues and students working uh, on pandemic modeling, and you might have seen their work in the news uh, quite a bit. Um, another thing that uh, arose during COVID uh, that you might not have seen in the past was this idea of patient transfers between hospitals. So ICUs and wards that get uh, full in one region might transfer their patients out to a hospital somewhere else for, for um, continuing to care for those patients and to ensure that the first hospital doesn't get overwhelmed. Uh, and so these things didn't really happen in a systematic fashion pre-COVID, but now it is very much a part of the health system response to just surges in uh, occupancy in hospitals. Um, another COVID-induced uh, issue was around, you know, um, uh, a ramping down of elective surgeries, and so the backlog has grown, and so now there's a lot of research that's being done looking into how do we allocate surgical capacity, how do we schedule so that we can reduce the backlog as quickly and as equitably as possible. Um, other research that's happening around um, scheduling in long-term care homes and hospitals and, uh, and projects around, for example, uh, forecasting wait times for pediatric occupational and physical therapists. These are just a few examples of the many uh, types of research projects that are happening right now. And, and if you're interested in any of these, I'm happy to, to talk to you about this uh, more later on. Okay, so in terms of the specific research program that I want to briefly touch on today, uh, it centers around uh, improving response to out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. And I think this problem is very neatly summarized in this quote. Uh, you can see I like quotes a lot. Um, so it, uh, the quote is from uh, Marvin, the paranoid robot from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And he says, I could calculate your chances of survival, but you won't like it. And even though he was talking about space travel, he could very well have been talking about cardiac arrest. Cardiac arrest is when your heart uh, basically stops uh, pumping in a coordinated fashion, you will become unconscious, you'll fall to the ground, and uh, your chances of survival are very, very low, and they're very uh, time sensitive. So you hope that a bystander will see you collapse and call 911, and then start CPR, and hopefully find a defibrillator to, uh, to basically shock your heart uh, kind of back into a normal rhythm. Okay, and as a and that's really all that you can do as a bystander is, is to do CPR and to find a defibrillator. And when, um, when I say this, this last point here about survival depending on luck, uh, we really think about all of, this, all of the things that really have to line up for someone to survive, right? Someone has to, generally speaking, it, it doesn't have to be the case, but ideally someone sees you survive, uh, sorry, someone sees you collapse, and then that person calls 911, uh, you describe what's happening to the 911 operator and they determine and they have to determine it's cardiac arrest and they have to send the ambulance right away. Um, that the person who called is hopefully willing to do CPR. Hopefully there's another bystander around who can go run and get a defibrillator and bring it back. Uh, you got to put the defibrillator on the patient and the, the heart has to be in a certain rhythm for even it to be shockable uh, and, and so on and so forth. So we refer to this as, as the chain of survival. And you need all of these links in this chain to be active uh, for someone to have a, the best chance of survival. And if any one link is broken, uh, then the chances of survival are very low. And that's what I mean when I, when, I th when I think about luck, right? There's all of these things that have to happen and a lot of it is very luck driven. And what we're trying to do in our research is remove luck from the equation. Uh, and, and so the one link I'm gonna focus on today is this idea of how do we get a defibrillator to a patient? 
Okay. Right now it relies on you knowing the surrounding area. You might know, oh, there's a defibrillator in the Tim Hortons down the street, or there's a defibrillator in the mall, uh, you know, in the security area of the mall or something, right? But can we uh, get a defibrillator to you and not rely on, you know, a random person knowing where it is? So, uh, so this idea of using a drone to deliver a defibrillator is actually not that new. It's actually started back in 2014. Uh, there was a, a graduate student, a graduate engineering student in the Netherlands who actually developed this prototype drone defibrillator, this picture that you see here. The drone itself is the defibrillator. You pull the pads out and you can use it to uh, place on the patient and hopefully shock their heart. Um, that led to uh, a couple of years later to a lot of research that has been done uh, partially from uh, my group and other groups around the world that looks at modeling to determine how we optimize drone networks. You know, where would we place drone bases? How would we optimize their response to complement what ambulances are currently doing? Uh, and then quickly that moved to uh, test flights to simulated cardiac arrests that were happening in Sweden starting in 2017. And then in, in our backyard here in Ontario, uh, Transport Canada approved test flights in Ontario with uh, beyond visual line of sight. So the drone is leaving from one place to a, a, another location where the operator actually can't see where it's going. And so it's relying on the drone to navigate. Uh, and then just two short years after that, the very first save with the drone delivered defibrillator happened uh, in the world. Uh, this happened in Sweden. You might've uh, seen this in the news. It was around Christmas time in 2021. Okay. So if you look at this timeline from basically a pie in the sky concept to uh, we're not we're not really at full fledged implementation yet, but but a, a situation where it was actually used on a real life patient and it actually saved this person uh, seven short years. So um, quite we're moving quite rapidly along the, the development curve. Uh, some of the ongoing research that is happening with our group right now. Uh, so we're continuing to collaborate with uh, individuals in different jurisdictions to optimize the design of drone networks. So. Uh, based on the initial work that we've done, we've become a bit of a well-known uh, leading group in this area. So we're working with colleagues in DC, in the US and in Europe to, to extend what we've done uh, and uh, generalize into their regions. Uh, we are doing some work related to using machine learning to figure out when to dispatch drones. So um, we want to be able to balance improving outcomes, basically figure out what situations are most um, beneficial to dispatch drones. We don't want to dispatch them every single call that comes in, right? Because that won't be efficient from a resource utilization perspective and the drone might be unavailable for the next call. Okay, we're continuing to do pilot testing. Uh, and so this is happening in, in Peel region in Ontario and in other regions as well, where we are um, basically trying to test out the drone's uh, capabilities in, in you know, daytime, nighttime, in different weather conditions, in different uh, geographies to see if we can navigate you know, trees and power lines and things like this. And we are working together with a bunch of US colleagues towards running a clinical trial uh, using uh, randomizing drones to different regions for cardiac arrest response. Uh, and then finally, um, looking at analysis of cost effectiveness of drones, uh, not just for cardiac uh, arrest, but for different types of EMS response. Uh, this picture on the left is actually a video, which I'll just play really briefly. Um, so this is actually a video of one of our pilot flights uh, in the summer of 2019. This is in Ontario. This is a mock cardiac arrest. This is not a real cardiac arrest, but we have volunteers here working on a mannequin, so a, not a real patient. Simulate a call to the 911. Uh, the drone actually flies in and they drop the defibrillator from a certain height. The defibrillator is wrapped in a very protective case, so it's not going to get damaged along the way. And we have two testing to make sure that was the case as well. Uh, the second bystander goes and runs and gets the defibrillator, opens it up, and it's not a This is an example of the type of practical research that's happening right now into, um, into making this a reality. So what is the vision for the future of this work? So for, in terms of cardiac arrest, the vision is really around simultaneous dispatch of drones with ambulance that will eventually lead to an improved survival uh, from cardiac arrest. Uh, and, and as this case in Sweden uh, attests, we are perhaps closer than we think uh, to, to that end goal. Uh, but then the, the other thing to, to consider is that, you know, there's nothing um, specific about cardiac arrest that drones can, can, um, can tackle. Drones can tackle a lot of other types of time sensitive medical emergencies. So if you think about uh, someone who's having an, an allergic reaction, they don't have an EpiPen around, you can imagine a drone speeding an EpiPen to you. If it's an opioid overdose, a drone could bring you a naloxone kit. Uh, if it was a major uh, car crash or some kind, a drone could bring a trauma kit with tourniquets and bandages 
and things like that to stop the bleed. So I think the potential for this type of technology uh, in addressing a variety of um, very time sensitive medical emergencies is, is really uh, unlimited. And so I'll just leave you with uh, this quote and just a few uh, final words. So this is a quote from that patient who survived in Sweden. Uh, I can't put into words how thankful I am to this new technology and the speedy delivery of the defibrillator. If it wasn't for the drone, I probably wouldn't be here. This is a truly revolutionary technology that needs to be implemented all over. Sudden cardiac arrests can happen to anyone. And, and I like to think about this picture on the right-hand side as really embodying the, the phrase, you know, it takes a village, right? In order to, to get this technology to work, we need engineers, obviously, we need uh, doctors, we need paramedics, we need uh, transportation experts, we need regulators involved, and perhaps most importantly, we need all of you, the public, as bystanders to these potential emergencies in the future to react when you see something, because if you, if you don't react and if everyone steps up, then all of our research can, uh, can really contribute. Okay, I think that is all of my time and I will, uh, I will stop here. Thank you very much. Great, thanks, Tim, for a, a really inspiring presentation on that interface between engineering and, and healthcare and medicine and just uh, the amazing uh, opportunities that lie ahead. Uh, thanks for all the work. Actually, I know I forgot to mention it, but I wasn't going to give steal your thunder with uh, the work you did early on in the pandemic around the patient transfer stuff. I think that's a really terrific example. And there is a link, actually. I'm going to go back to Ellen. I can always drive a linkage between everything. Um, and that is really the, the, the Center for Healthcare Engineering and now the linkage with Manchester and Melbourne around global healthcare innovation uh, that's being driven by, by Dion Almond as an example of, again, these kind of partnerships which, which loop us with other institutions. And it's a really terrific opportunity for our students and our faculty to engage in, in impact uh, on a global scale. So we have a, a very short period of time. <laughs> this is actually the reason we're doing questions at the end versus in between, because otherwise it would have become uh, lunch and dinner and learn and continued on all day. Um, so I've got a, a couple of questions for actually all of our speakers, um, but I'm gonna just start, um, actually gonna start with one for Dave, and this came in during the presentation. Um, and it's a question uh, from Earl who asks, um, is recovering, so this is a bit of a, an interesting question, is it recovering CO2 to make ethanol so you can burn it and produce more CO2 rather circular? <laughs> Unless you're making ethanol for, like you said, for Merlot and then, you know. <laughs> for Merlot, yeah, for certainly. I mean, I guess, you know, in a lot of ways, Earl, circular logic is not something we we aspire to, but, but circular in terms of CO2 is, right? Um, it, you know, right now we think about where these sources come from. In the case of ethanol, if it goes into fuels, uh, as in your example, um, you know, that's coming, that's, that's displacing fossil energy that would otherwise come out of the ground and just be vented to CO2. A circular model where we, where we close that loop is, is desirable, um, very much so. But, but to your point, right, you need to connect it and you need to do that capture piece uh, for sure. The, the other part there that's intertangled is the storage part. Um, the renewables that we're all cheering and we're all using, the challenge is they don't have the storage. And where does energy storage come from in our current economy? Chemical, chemical storage, right? So that's why these chemical forms are so important. Getting them from CO2 is the, is the focus of this work. Great question. Great. Thanks, Dave. Um, I'm going to actually jump in and I'll go to Elham next uh, on, a, on a bit of a global question. Um, and this is, I think, I mean, you've got some terrific models of how you're rolling out on Invest. And I guess a, a question we got here is, is how can faculty, and I'm going to include myself in that, uh, incorporate global competency in the classroom? And, and how do you assess global competencies? Um, and I guess, should they be assessed? How, how, do you, how do you see doing that? So I think global competencies are, when it, when it really boils down to it, being mindful of the conditions that are required in each different environment. So as individual faculty, uh, when we're solving for problems, I think both David and Timothy today have shared problems that are genuinely global. We're not just focused on them here in Canada. Uh, considering different environments that this may need to, to be applied. Timothy, you shared an example that, you know, this was happening in Sweden or this could be happening in, you know, Sub-Saharan Africa. It doesn't matter where. So I think when we take 
into our classrooms, concepts that we're teaching students or into our research, global mindedness and developing intercultural skills. Uh, at, at first glance, it starts with opening up the conversation and including the idea that this could this could be a problem anywhere else in the world. And if it was somewhere else in the world, what are some of those conditions that affect us? So I think that's the first step. That's the, that's the short answer. <laughs> it's a challenge, right? I mean, I think we, we can leverage the fact that um, our student, we draw from a global community, right? We've got 40 or 50 different countries that our students are drawn from, which I think is astounding, especially if you consider, I mean, we've got alums from different generations, different decades going back. And I think if you look back at your class back in the 50s or the 60s, you certainly didn't draw from as many as we are drawing from now. And I think this is part of our opportunity to, to learn from the, the students we're bringing in, both at the undergrad and graduate level. Um, and for, you know, we're, we're getting our students back out in that context as well. Um, there was also a nice question here from, from Marvin about um, Elham. I know this is the second question for Elham, but um, how do you overcome inter-country language differences or does everybody talk in English? So I love that question from Marvin. I have been teaching the modules this session, uh, this because we offer them once every semester. Marvin, I've been teaching them in Spanish, and I promise you, I don't speak a word of Spanish. So not all of our students uh, speak that speak English. However, up until now, most of our teams have had English speaking members. But up at this semester, we've had Spanish speaking team members, and we've been translating our materials. And so I think it's it's so easy with the technology that we have right now that even I, who doesn't speak Spanish, can speak Spanish. <laughs> I was going to say math is the universal. Isn't math the universal language? And we, we all, we're engineers. So we can always teach each other in math. But anyways, I don't want to go down that Maybe path. Maybe I shouldn't like, say little... this, but I don't speak math. I was going to say, <laughs> I think I think all of our alum have have memories they want to forget of first year calculus. So we just, we won't go down that path at all. All right. Last question to Tim. Um, I'm going to ask you, let's see, what kind of challenging question to ask Tim? Um, the, uh, actually, so, so actually your, your video was, was kind of a rural setting, right? Um, a little bit, right? And, and I guess the question here is, um, recognizing that, that drone delivery decreases time for rural and remote, uh, communities. Um, what, what are your thoughts around the, the, the more urban environment, I mean, frankly, actually Toronto keeps expanding. So I think we're going to become kind of like the entire Ontario is going to be one giant city. But what, how do we, is drone delivery going to be in, in an urban environment going to be the similar kind of uh, return on investment? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I don't know that we know the answer to this yet. I think if you talk with lots of people um, who are doing like, you know, like Angela, like who are doing aerospace and like looking at drones specifically, right? I think they'll say that uh, still navigating a, a very, built up urban environment is, is tricky, especially if we're gonna fly these drones autonomously. So that's why all of the pilot testing is being done out in, in rural areas. But I, I think it's only a matter of time before we can bring it into the urban setting. I mean, think about you know Amazon delivering your shoes or whatever by, by drone. I, that's gonna happen at some point, I'm sure. Right? Uh, I think the, 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 the trade off here is more around like, it, you know, it comes back to the cost benefit, right? So for, for the rural area, you're gonna have fewer people who will benefit a lot. Uh, and for the urban areas, you might have more people, but they might benefit uh, less because, you know, ambulance response is already probably pretty good in a, in a dense uh, urban area. So I think these are the types of trade-offs that we, we have to explore still. Right. And there's, and there's even more AEDs being stationed literally everywhere, right? And so that, right. that sort of changes yeah. the dynamic a little bit. So you can imagine some sort of hybrid situation where maybe drones are going to be really useful for more rural and, you know, longer distances. Maybe you have sidewalk robots that bring you, you know, the drones in a dense urban area, you know, coupled with maybe static 80s in certain areas where people can just go run and grab them. So right. Terrific. Thanks, Tim. Um, all right. I know, I know we're running up, we're running uh, short on time. And uh, I know Elham actually you have to teach. So you're gonna have to run down the stairs in my hall shortly to uh, to teach. But I, first off, I'm gonna say first, uh, thank you to all of our uh, our um, audience for being here today. Uh, special thanks to all our panelists, uh, Dave Sinton, Elham Marzi and, and Tim Chan for I mean, taking time out of your busy schedule. Um, just about to go teach um, for sharing your insights today. Um, as you can tell, I'm I'm super excited and optimistic about everything I hear, and I I love the ability. I love my job so much in terms of just hearing what everyone's doing and 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 the opportunity I have 
to help uh, drive those and provide people with the incentive. And as, as Tim hinted, um, <laughs> I am the giant bank that helps to try to support all these amazing innovations and uh, driving us forward. So I'm, I'm just going to leave you with the one thought, which is really, this is just the beginning of a conversation. Um, you've heard from three different faculty. We have more than 270 other faculty, all of which are international leaders in their respective fields. And there's so much more that lies ahead for us to discover. Um, much of uh, what you've heard about today is, is related to specific uh, funds, which are, are the goals of our faculty and the larger Defy Gravity campaign. And, and these are opportunities for you, our alumni, to help, help move us forward, um, supporting initiatives that you find to be the most important. And I'll just give you some examples of these. Um, we have a Healthy People Fund, which supports our researchers and faculty and students working at the intersection, uh, as, as Tim actually hinted at, of medicine, life sciences, and engineering to prevent illness, treat disease, uh, including acute uh, circumstances and improve the quality of life. Uh, we have a healthy planet fund which catalyzes projects on clean water, food security, uh, sustainable energy, green buildings, and more. We have some really exciting uh, opportunities coming ahead in that particular space. Uh, and an innovations in technology and design fund which really looks at new areas, uh, artificial intelligence, industrial robotics, medical tools. Um, and one which is certainly near and dear to my heart, as, as I've hinted in terms of the international context, uh, a global impact fund, uh, Engineers for the World, uh, which really supports the development of global citizens uh, by providing access to cross-cultural exchanges, uh, global education and research opportunities. And there's, again, tons of ways uh, which you can have an impact uh, on the future of the faculty. And I, I certainly invite you to follow us online, as we're doing right now. Um, on social media, um, but hopefully, and not even a word, word eventually is in my notes here, but I might say sooner than that uh, in person um, uh, to find out more. We are uh, looking forward to, I know Sonia is looking forward to, I think all of our students are looking forward to uh, in-person convocation uh, this spring. Uh, we're certainly happy that we're gonna have an in-person Iron Ring event uh, coming up shortly. So uh, things are starting to spin back uh, to normal. And so we're looking forward to many more in-person uh, events and alumni events coming forward. And I look forward to as well for our, our alums who are abroad, uh, a chance to visit soon. I think CK, you're on the call. So I'm looking forward to getting a chance to visit you in Singapore soon enough. Um, thanks everyone again for uh, taking your time today to be at this uh, astounding event to hear from our faculty uh, on their really innovative research. Um, look forward to seeing everyone soon. Uh, Feel free to drop me out. Look forward to hearing from everyone as well. And again, uh, wishing everyone a, a terrific day. And I hope this is really the beginning of uh, terrific conversations to, for the future. Thanks, everyone.